Welcome to another video as part of the Pavilion video series, VMware Storage Queuing. So when VMware storage queues are tuned for slow storage and they need to be tuned for modern fast storage. I am Kostas Apopoulos, the Chief Field Technology Officer for Pavilion Data. I'll be joined by David Klee, our main presenter today, the founder of Heraflex Technology and a deep SQL Server VMware expert. So as I mentioned, this video is going to focus on the storage queues and how to tune them for fast storage because the default is for slow storage. That fast storage like NVMe storage like Pavilion's Hyperparallel Flash Array. We're going to focus on hypervisor queues, queue scheduling, VMK queuing, multipathing, DSNRO, as well as virtual disk controllers and database workload distribution. So before we get into the presentation and an introduction of David, let's talk about Pavilion and how Pavilion unleashes the power of Windows and SQL Server. Of course, we work well for every single workload, but if you have super high bandwidth per host needs with ultra low latency, this is where we really, really shine, whether that's large or small block sizes, whether that's read or write. Specifically, that relates to SQL Server. So that Pavilion platform that has impressive IOPS and the millions of IOPS and the impressive throughput, but what is most impressive is that latency in the range of 100 microsecond read to 25 microsecond write latency. All of that packed into four rack units and over two petabytes of usable capacity. Whether you're leveraging that platform for a Windows environment running SQL Server on bare metal, leveraging NVMe TCP or NVMe Rocky. We have certified drivers from Windows to support both of those environments. What's really impressive, you can get similar or same performance of bare metal inside of VMware running SQL Server in Windows, leveraging VMware 7.0 and Pavilion support for NVMe over Fabric Rocky for uh, VMware 7.0. So whether it's bare metal on Windows for Windows or whether it's virtualized inside of VMware, incredible performance, but ultimately low latency, which drives incredible results for SQL Server. So our presenter today, I'm excited to introduce the founder of Heraflex Technologies and Sequilibrium Education, David Klee. David is an incredible performance tuner, enterprise DBA and infrastructure architect and self-proclaimed geek. David's expertise in SQL Server and VMware are the best I've seen. His ability to intersect the storage, the software, and the virtualized infrastructure or non-virtual infrastructure, and to tune the system to get the most out of SQL Server is incredibly impressive. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, David, and let's learn more about SQL Server. Thank you, Costa. When we talk enterprise storage and databases, no discussion will be complete without talking about hypervisors. Now, in this case, we're going to be talking a lot about VMware, but all these concepts directly apply to Hyper-V, uh, you know, uh, KVM, any of the, the Linux variants. It all applies. You just may change some terminology in there. In a virtual environment, every compute resource, so CPU memory network disk, has a queue associated to it so that these virtual machines can transparently get access to that compute resource. It's present for everything. This is how the hypervisor actually works. This is how the hypervisor can share access to these compute resources for multiple active VMs. The VMs don't see it. The VMs think they have direct access to this stuff, but if everything is not created equal in here, this can actually hold you back. If it's done right, life is good. These are not always first in, first out. Things can be prioritized within the hypervisor. So we gotta be really careful how these things are lined up. Now in this case, we're gonna be talking about VMware specifically, but again, this stuff directly applies to all the hypervisors out there. When you have a lot of SQL servers in a virtual environment, it tends to get funneled to the sand through a lot of these arguably really interesting defaults around storage queuing. If the SAN is tuned right, if the interconnects are set up right, and if the physical architecture is configured right, this can become a primary bottleneck to peak performance of storage. Every one of these things stacks up. 
all of the queues in between work. So if we have a lot of different VMs all submitting tasks in there, in this case, we'll say CPU, if that starts to stack up, everything behind it gets hurt. It slows down. Life is not good. It just, it slows the business operation down. If you're not tuning this stuff appropriately, you can end up introducing a bigger challenge. If you tune from the top down, you'll hit some of these bottlenecks underneath and things are not good. You have to tune from the bottom up. Now, for all intents and purposes, we're going to assume that you're on very good modern storage. We're going to assume that your interconnects are fast. We're going to assume that your physical topology is now set up properly. So now we're talking about the hypervisor itself. So first of all, if you made any changes to an HBA or a hardware iSCSI queue depth underneath the hypervisor, you need to go check to see if the drivers inside VMware are actually tailored appropriately. There are driver settings in here that can set the queue depths here. Now, sometimes this is the only thing you need to do if there's no firmware in a, a BIOS that's doing this adjustment. VMware's got a KB article 1267. It's been around that long. Uh, it's got full details on how to go do this. So QLogic, Emulax, you know, Mellanox, things like that. They have hard-coded QDEPs in there. Most of the time, they don't know what kind of storage you're connecting. So they assume it's the slowest possible one. If you're running iSCSI, especially a software iSCSI initiator, your default queue depth is 128. So that's better than some of these fiber cards, but you can still increase that. Test all the way up to 256, sometimes even higher, depending on the speed of your underlying storage. There's a VMware KB article here, it's really long, so I shortened it. It gives you details on how to change this iSCSI adapter queue depth. Now, you've got LUNs connected. Sometimes, the VMware default of 1,000 IOPS before it starts to round robin between available paths might actually slow you down. That is a default behavior. Literally, we'll use one path until you hit 1,000 IOPS, and then it'll move to another path for a different VM, but not for the same VM. Validate this. Go figure out, is round robin IOPS of one to forcefully tell it to multipath per data store per host, is this advantageous to your workload? In some cases, it actually is. There's a VMware KB article right here that will tell you how to go identify this and will actually go change your LUN architecture. Now, some environments don't need it, some do. Check with your vendor to see if it's needed or supported. Sometimes they'll have plugins for it, sometimes they don't, sometimes you don't need it. If the interconnects are just straight up fast enough, we don't want that overhead of aggressively multipathing. Go verify with them. Now, there is a little known thing inside VMware, and this one's specific to VMware. It's a setting called disk.scednumrec outstanding, or DSNRO. <clears throat> it is per host, per data store. It gets interesting. Now, VMware specifically calls, quote, a world, it's a virtual machine and it's dependent virtual disks. If one and only one world lives on that data store, the queue depth to this data store is inherited from what the virtual machine is actually sending it. So if we're doing this properly, we're using multiple pair of virtual SCSI controllers or NVMe controllers, we have a pretty darn high queue depth. It inherits all of that and everything is okay. Now, what happens if we do what just about everybody out there does, and we have more than one VM or world present on a single data store? In this case, it can become an immediate bottleneck because guess what? They drop the queue depth to just 32. That's too low for modern storage. It's not very fun. It has not been changed in a long, long time. You can adjust this higher. Depending on your storage architecture, depending on your interconnects and all that, if you're on Flash Hybrid or, or Flash or NVMe, I definitely recommend bumping this up. So if you just change your HBA or iSCSI Q depths in there, go verify this. You can bump this up. So if you're on NVMe storage, you could probably go all the way up to 254. It's a max setting here. Do it. It does make a big difference. There's a doc again down here. It'll tell you how to do it. Now, we know that the virtual disk layer has a bunch of queuing opportunities in there as well. So from a VMware perspective, we want more than one disk controller. If you're on Hyper-V, do four, you just don't have an option to change a type in there. The hypervisor and the operating system do guest queuing 
not just by disk, but by disk controller. Each one of these has an associated QDAP. So you get up to four, use them. Use all four of these. You can use the NVMe controller when appropriate, but please note, as of the 7.0 release, you cannot expand virtual disks connected to an NVMe controller without a reboot. It's not part of the standard. It wasn't implemented. I hope they get to it at some point in time. So right now, I'm more comfortable using the PVSCSI controllers. Now we get to the queue depth on these things. The pair of virtual SCSI controller is absolutely critical for performance. The real big reason is the queue depth. The LSI Logic SAS controller is the native default one. It's built into the operating system. It's been there forever, but it's there for compatibility. It has a maximum queue depth of just 32 concurrent IO operations. For a lot of these storage arrays, that's simply too low. Now, a long time ago, they introduced a new controller as part of the VMware Tools package called the PVSCSI controller, a pair of virtual SCSI. It has a default queue depth of 64, but it's registry overridable all the way up to 254. Now, do not blindly go all the way up to 254 like the VMware KB article says. A lot of times, it can actually overwhelm normal storage arrays, but it's absolutely critical for the, the really good storage arrays. Please only tune this after the underlying storage layers, so the HBAs, DSNRO, things like that. All those have to be tuned or else you end up essentially shoving more I.O. operations into these bottlenecks and it just makes it worse. Now we hit workload distribution from a database workload and engine perspective, and this is where things get really interesting. Our guest operating system and the hypervisor both do IO coalescing, not just by disk, but by disk controllers. So it's not just that we turn on a pair of virtual SCSI controller and call it good. Now we need a lot of them, as many as we can get all the way up to the four. And we have to spread out our database workload amongst the available controllers. Now, this is a very normal practice for DBAs to want to spread this data around, but it directly applies to VMware and all the other hypervisors here as well. So a lot of times we'll split out the operating system and the SQL Server home and maybe the system databases separately, but then where it gets really interesting. We have more one or more LUNs for our user database data files. We'll have an additional one or more set of LUNs for our logs. We'll have one or more for tempdb. And if we're doing local backups, we'll do the exact same thing there. To better understand your workload, please use Perfmon or IOSTAT to really understand the demand that is being placed on these, uh, these volumes and balance them across your controllers. And this way you get the maximum amount of IO queuing coming to and from inside that virtual machine. So please, whatever you do, try to standardize this. I know this is very specific based on your workloads, Standardize the best that you can, largely because we don't need crazy configurations floating around everywhere that are custom to them. You know, there's always going to be one-offs, but try to standardize the best that you can. You can get pretty complicated with this stuff as well. So multiple active storage controllers, multiple disk pools, more lines, more object distribution. So if you look, in this case, we got a ton of active controllers, so really good metadata management, really good potential to get that interconnect all the way there quickly. Spread out your transaction logs between your multiple databases. Each database can have different file groups and different data files spread across more LUNs, across more disk controllers. If you do this carefully, you get better storage concurrency at the database engine layer at the operating system layer inside the virtual machine, in the SAN controller, the interconnects, the physical interconnects, all this stuff, it just gets better because you can spread it out wider. And then when you hit five of these, 10 of these, a thousand of these, you end up minimizing these individual points that become bottlenecks for these things at a macro level. So spread your workload out, let this thing move closer to the speed of business and not traditional IT, and everybody wins. In all of my years of SQL Server engineering, storage latency matters more than anything else. This is where I see Pavilion fitting in. It scales, the NVMe media, the PCI switch architecture, the multiple active controllers, all of it matters. Costa is going to show some performance numbers that you really might not believe, but take it from me. I'm an independent consultant designing some of the largest systems in the world. Thank you. This thing works. 
I love the opportunity to share absolutely nerdy details about SQL Server data platforms. Back to you, Costa. Thank you, David. Great insights as always. As we summarize this video, let's bring it back to something that's really core to SQL Server, latency. So as we look at a pavilion storage array, it's always sub-microsecond latency, whether that's bare metal or VMware, whether that's read or that's write. Impressive latency drives lots of things upstream to SQL Server that are all good. It pushes the bottleneck from the storage to somewhere else inside a SQL Server ecosystem. So we have demonstrated through this table that is a disk speed on Windows with a single Windows host and a single NIC, some very impressive latency, whether that's Windows bare metal, the first two columns, Windows TCP and Windows RDMA, the read, and then the first two columns on the right. But what's equally impressive is the latency by taking that same ecosystem and put it inside of VMware. Similar or same latency, or in some cases better, depending on the protocol, than bare metal. So as we see, latency is key to SQL Server, and Pavilion can deliver impressive latency, bare metal or inside a virtualized VMware ecosystem. Thank you so much for spending time today with us learning more about SQL Server and how to optimize the SQL Server ecosystem to get the most out of your investment. Special thanks to David Klee, our SQL Server extraordinaire. We appreciate all the partnership and all your insights you've given us today. If you want to learn more, come check out our other videos at www.pavilion.io or reach out to us via email at info at pavilion.io. Of course, you can always call us on the phone. We'd love to talk to you about how Pavilion can help you optimize your SQL Server environment and get more out of your investment. Thank you for your time.